I am delighted to introduce Leona Prince. It's so great when you just can Twitter private message your friends to ask them to do something. And then like a month later, they're like, what did I agree to? So um, thanks Leona for joining us, for being in this work together with us, for sharing your practice. And I'm just going to share my, your slides with everyone. Thank you so much, Leighton, and thank and welcome everyone. Um, like you said, Sai Suzi, Leona Prince, Naruten Watsanatsan, Laksamasi Watsanatsan. And so that means I'm from the Lake Babi Nation, as you see in my name title, and I belong to the Laksamasi or Beaver Clan. We are a matriarchal society. Welcome everyone. And right now I am here, and this is very important, and this has been a thread throughout this whole evening together of acknowledgement of territory. Right now I'm coming to you from the traditional unceded territory of the Tsilkazko people, the Burns Lake Band. And it's always, I both live and work on their territory. And we'll just get to it, next slide. So our learning objectives ground us in what we're gonna be talking about today. How do we use personal story to ground our work and help us reflect? What are potential barriers to equity work or inclusion work or diversity work? And then how do we integrate indigenous worldviews and knowledges into our classroom seamlessly? Uh, slide. <laughs> so, there's a big, bold statement here, and is that everything you need to know about honoring diversity and honoring students is can be done in fish camp. Um, I was on a road trip with my superintendent, Manu, and way back in 2017, when you could drive in a car with other people, and uh, we were talking about this experience I had in fish camp. Every year, part of my seasonal rounds is to go out to this place. This is Nidoat's um, Old Fort, British Columbia. You can only get there by boat. This is where my two matriarchs in my family, my late Auntie Robbie and my Auntie Marlene, have their fish camp and where they live primarily in the summer and throughout the year. And so one of the things that grounds me as, as an Indigenous person, as an educator, and helps fill my bucket, I'm actually going to start my timer, uh, Shelly's experience scared me. Uh, <laughs> uh, one of the things that uh, helps me ground myself and get me gets me ready for the upcoming school year um, and recharges my batteries is this piece. Um, to live amongst my, my family and my community and participate in something that has been practiced um, in various ways throughout our entire family history uh, since time immemorial. And I, I was talking to Manu and I said, you know what, fish camp is the most inclusive environment ever. And if we're gonna learn something in education, we can learn it from this community of this practice and this community. And I said, because there are tons of people out there with that wear the labels of intersectionality um, that we talk about and are some of the most marginalized people, but boy, do they shine out there during fish camp. And I said, I can think of a former student of our school district who had some, you know, barriers, I wouldn't even call them barriers, it's just a part of who he was. You know, he had some intellectual is issues um, that stopped him from being successful in our system. And yet there, we trust him with, you'd see that beautiful boat, my, my aunt's Quintaka, which means runs around. <laughs> uh, her, her boat and trust, we trust him with our boats. Um, we trust him with our safety. He is a masterful hunter and, and it's just an incredibly important part of our community. Um, we don't think about the, the deficit model in, in fish camp. And the interesting thing is that when you go out to fish camp, the first thing you do is, is you're assigned tasks and they have varying levels of difficulties and, um, and you get to go through all of them. The first is cleaning the fish. Um, often this is done with by children, they go and they're they're cleaning it out after it's cut. You see one of the major jobs here is untangling the fish. And then there's cutting and packing and processing, all of which we go through again and again. This could be hundreds of fish in a day to support the community and nurse the community. Um, and there's no shame in not being good at one of the subjects or areas of, of this, this process, um, which 
is generosity and reciprocity, giving back to your community and taking care of your family. Um, and wouldn't it be great if in our schools we had a community that took care of everybody, didn't label them and honored them for their strengths. And so <laughs> one of the least favorite job, but the job that I do well is untangling fish because I, I have problem solving skills. And so I, you know, I've dabbled in cutting and I've dabbled in, in packing and hanging and uh, my, you know, fine motor skills aren't that great. And I'm fair with a knife, but never have I been shamed at my inability to fillet like my cousin who took this photo, Carmen, who's a chef and her knife skills are amazing, right? So we hold each other up in this community and, and just celebrate each other's strengths and we all work together towards a common goal. And so when I think about inclusion and I think about honoring diversity and perspectives in education, I think of Fish Camp. And if we can get to that place where there's no labels here, there is the honoring of people for their strengths and a, and a completely inclusive environment, I think will be better for it. And so that is how I think of inclusion. That's what I, I think about in terms of equity and honoring and children. Um, I think about this very old, very community-based, a community of learners and, and teachers and guides. Um, and, and this practice has been going on forever. So if we can find a way to take that learning and embed it in our education system will be better for it because none of the people out there feel shamed or marginalized. Um, they all feel honored for their gifts. Slide. So I've been thinking about this lady lately because it's really relevant in the work that I'm doing right now with my team. I have a huge team um, and in, in our our work in equity, inclusion, and honoring diversity. Um, and there are potential barriers. And there's the large level barriers that exist and then the personal barriers that exist. So I'm gonna talk about two of those barriers because I think it's really important for this conversation. Also gonna have a drink, I'm getting, getting a bit parched and I have a video out there where you can tell I'm totally, <laughs> my mouth is totally dry and it makes me cringe when I see it. So on the left, this is fear. Fear is the biggest barrier for any work. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm speaking specifically about Indigenous education because that's the work that I do primarily. Um, but you can extrapolate this to any area of inclusion, diversity, and um, equity. And so fear is one of those things that I talk about, talk to educators about often. And it's because it's the one thing that is limiting the potential uh, for all of us within this province. And I wanna validate that fear. And I'm gonna tell you a story about how I was put in the shoes of educators. Uh, I had my own experience with this um, because often educators are like, well, I don't wanna say you know, the wrong thing or do the wrong thing. They feel like they're gonna trip up and there's gonna be repercussions for it. So a few weeks ago, I was um, invited to this meeting and it was to figure out a way that we can come together in this province, different folks in the province to support um, our two-spirited students, Indigenous students that are part of the LGBTQ2 plus community. And I felt like a fish out of water. I, I, it was a completely humbling experience for me um, because I hadn't ever had to think about my heterosexuality and, and my, you know, cisgenderedness, whatever. See, I don't even know the terms, but I'm going to make that the term. I hadn't had to think about that. And I hadn't even in my own metacognition about privilege thought about how this world was really built for me. And I had a fear in that space. I didn't want to take up space for those who are from that community. I didn't want to say the wrong thing. I didn't want to insult folks. Um, I felt fearful. And so 
cut to the next week, I'm talking to my friend Manu, and I'm like, oh my goodness. I told them about this experience in this meeting, and I was like, I know what it's like for a non-Indigenous teacher to try to teach Indigenous things. I had never been put in that place because everywhere I go, I talk about Indigenous education. This was a different different thing that we were talking about and I wasn't entirely comfortable with it. And I hadn't fully recognized my privilege. It's one of the things that we have to do in this work is recognize our both earned and unearned privileges if we're gonna move forward. And boy, did my list grow. And I sat there and just in amazement because I had never really considered some things and that's just it. We're not doing these things intentionally. Um, and intentionality is one of the biggest tools that we can use to sort of dissolve our fear. If we know as educators in this province that we're trying to do work in Indigenous education or other uh, types of education with good intentions, then we should be held up and we should feel good that we're doing things in a good way. You hear a, a ton of Indigenous uh, folks saying doing things in a good way and really what it means with good intention for the betterment of everybody. So that's one of those things and I want to acknowledge fear and how we can overcome fear and that's through good intentions and ask. And <laughs> I told another group, I was like, when in doubt, you know, ask, you know, when in doubt, speak it out, like name your fears and go find knowledge holders to help you through that. I don't want to tax all the Indigenous education folks, but we're at a time when people are being courageous and, and trying to take risks in this work that they need support as well. And so I call out to all of my folks in Indigenous education who are already doing that work of support to just keep that in mind, that if we're asking people to take risks, then we need to help shoulder the responsibility um, if there are any repercussions. But um, we'll go into more how to integrate things. This is the overarching themes that I'd like to talk about, but I'll give you some practical examples to help cement your knowledge. So the other barrier is this thing called cognitive, cognitive dissonance. And the first time I heard this was a couple of years ago, my research partner, Bestie, you know, uh, Dr. Dustin Louie said this, and it was the first time I'd heard it, but not the first time I'd experienced it. And it is the conflict that people have when something that they believe to be true or assume to be true gets contradicted by new information. And we see this when we talk about Indigenous history and knowledges because the history of this country has assumed or believed certain things about Indigenous folks, Indigenous histories and experiences. And I, when the discoveries into Kamloops happened, I seen a lot of cognitive dissonance and people don't, it's not that they, they don't wanna understand. I think it's especially when things are really, really conflicting with their beliefs that they rely on this and they'll push back, right? And it's through no fault of their own. This is just something that happens in the minds of, of people, right? Um, but it, it exists and it is one of the barriers to the work that we're doing here um, within the middle years in the work that we're talking about today. And um, one of the examples that I heard was, um, and it was really hard to hear is, is, well, I heard from someone that they had a good experience at residential school. It's a hard thing to hear. That's jarring, especially A, if you've gone to residential schools or, or you're a child of someone who's gone to residential schools, because removing children forcibly from their home is, is trauma. That's it. That's the end of that argument. Everything that happened after that, um, you know, I don't think is relevant. I think there's survival of trauma and all those other pieces. So we're seeing a lot of cognitive dissonance in the area of this work because it really is advocacy. It really is honoring children. It really is taking care of children and, and doing what's right. And for whatever reason, some people hold true, you know, steadfast to some of their beliefs. And, and 
you know, through no fault of their own, there's been a huge legacy of these beliefs. And now we're learning new things and it's testing those beliefs and assumptions. And that's the, the phase or the, the era that we're in right now. Um, slide. <laughs> so my work um, has to do with indigenous pedagogy and equity. And lately we've been using this framework to help educators, you can use this district wide, or you can use this in your classroom. And, and it actually was, I'm glad that I spoke after Shelly. This is a little bit nod to Shelly's early work when she talked about entry points. And I always loved that idea because we talk about entry points for students, but educators also need them as well. We need to acknowledge what the entry point, and it really is a reflection of the learner's needs. So in this case, what we've been doing is we identify an entry point. And the example that I'm about to give you, which is land-based, is land-based learning. We want our entry point is how do we get our children onto the land and to learn, which is awesome because that's what you talked about last year. I was so excited when you said that. And what Indigenous knowledges or knowledge are we drawing from? right? And most importantly, this can't be a flash in the pan or performative. It needs to be sustainable. Um, we, we really like things that take an Indigenous knowledge, and it's not the one day thing, although I do understand that people are on a spectrum. They'll, they'll do, you know, integration, indigenization, and some of the other pieces, but we, we all have an entry point into that as well. It's a spectrum. But one of the things that we need to understand is that things need to be sustainable. And the best way to do that is through embedding Indigenous knowledges through value. Values, plural. <laughs> um, can I get next slide? So one of the things that we're presenting to our folks here in School District 91 is KO land relationships. And I'll explain a little bit what a, what a KO is. So in our bathlats or our potlatch system, we have hereditary chiefs. And each of the hereditary chiefs has a KO, a land of area, and it's mapped out beautifully, uh, that they're responsible for. And when we were looking at KOs, um, again, my research partner, Dustin, uh, came up with these knowledges. And they're from the, the 14 nations um, on which SD91 is on. And so there are four main principles of the KO land relationships that people have, Indigenous folks here in Nadodan, Wissoud, and Dhaka people have with the land. And the first one is that if you hold a KO, and you're a Deneza or Zekeza, which is the female male hereditary chief, one of your responsibilities is to walk the land. Once a year, you have to go out and you have to check the land that you're responsible for. That's that stewardship piece. This is why I loved um, all your beautiful explanations of land acknowledgement. Here's a way to decolonize that and embed that into your practice as an educator by taking that land acknowledgement and putting it to practice. And in, in any of the areas that you're in within BC, they'll, ha they'll have land rela relationships. You guys acknowledge the land from all the territories that you're from. Find out what the land relationship is uh, for those local peoples and, and embed that, the values of that within your practice. So the second, tell stories from the land. Oh my goodness. Oh, I'm just gonna let you know the recording's paused. I don't know if that was intentional. <laughs> No? Okay. <laughs> so uh, the second piece is tell stories from the land. When you go out um, and you're doing all of your stuff on the lawn, you come back and you tell stories from it. And I've seen this in person. I, uh, this year, I went out with my partner, Sean, onto the land and hunted for the first time. I'm a berry picker. I'm not a hunter. So I learned tons. And 
I noticed that this is, is still ingrained practice within our culture. We, as soon as he got back, he texted and phoned his dad, either texted or phoned and told what he's seen where, if there are any changes, especially on his father's trap line, what those changes were and reported back and told stories from the land, told funny hunting stories that we had, but definitely storytelling. Um, restore self from the connection to the land. And I already told you about going out to fish camp and how that reinvigorates you as a person. And when you're out there with your classrooms, you feel this too. You restore yourself. It fills your bucket, fills your cup, however you want to put it. But it's there, right? So you have to be purposeful in being restored. You know, I was joking the other day. I was like, all of a sudden they're calling it forest bathing. But BC, we forest bathe everywhere, right? And so uh, that's it a purposeful connection to the land and being refilled by it. And then the fourth principle is speak on behalf of the land. And we see that the land, it needs someone as a spokesperson. It, it really does, and we know that to be true. And so here are four KO principles. If you think about this, if you're a teacher within my school district, um, <laughs> you can use these four principles in your practice. Um, this is local knowledge, and that's what I want to stress, local knowledge. Do Am I telling you to participate in the ceremony of Bathlats? Go for it if you're invited, please. By all means, if you're invited to a potlatch, attend. It's, it'll be a rich experience. I'm not telling you to hold a potlatch. I'm not telling you to own your own KO unless you have land and you want to maintain it in that way. But what I'm telling you is these are the four values of land that exist within our territories. And you as an educator can embed that into your practice. And that's the way you, you can acknowledge the land fully. When you say the words, here's the action for those words. And so I think it's, it's incredibly important the things that we were talking about today and how it's all synthesized in this idea of land relationships. Um, there's many more examples. If you read, um, you know, coming up, Sarah talks about potlatch as pedagogy. There again is values. She's not telling you to, um, you know, to do all of these ceremonies in the class. What she's telling you is the values of that and how you can embed them into practice and make things meaningful. So, and it's it's crazy to me as I think about leadership and governance and education because those are all embedded in our potlatch system. Um, but we can draw a tremendous value from that. Um, in our school systems, if we just look at everything from values and move from there. And it kind of makes you think of the, well, it does make you think of the first people's principles of learning. Those are showing you a way of knowing and we, being and doing. And so what I, I guess I'm challenging folks to do is to go seek out knowledge, knowledge holders or knowledge from published materials from your own local um, area, your own local environments. Um, look at the values because there's incredible, look at these four values, just beautiful um, of way engaging with land-based education. Um, and then drawing out those, those values and those beliefs and those knowledges and worldviews of Indigenous folks uh, on the land that you acknowledge in words and then embed them and practice them. That's sustainable. That's a change in mindset. Um, when we talk about, you know, at you know, at the beginning of this, Denise talked about equity. And I will always maintain that the biggest gap in equity is our mindset. And the things working against it, like cognitive dissonance, um, long-held beliefs. Um, Shelley talked about colonial medical structures. All of those things are mindset. So the equity gap um, for diverse learners in this province is in our minds. And if we are to deconstruct that way of thinking and, and reconstruct it to include all of the voices of, of these territories, both indigenous and non-indigenous, we're gonna come to a place where our kids are gonna have the most rich experience that honors them for who they are. And that to me speaks to equity and inclusion and diversity. And it's really interesting to me. Um, one thing that I've been seeing to be true in this province is that we still stay in our lanes a little bit. 
But what made my heart full today is to listen to Leighton talk about Indigenous things and not seem apprehensive. That beautiful land acknowledgement by Shelley um, without the fear. Because sometimes, you know, at the beginning of this work, Denise talks about we would never hear that a few years ago. And I'm I'm echoing that right now because people wouldn't be so, you know, free to talk about those things. But we those silos still exist. I think the inclusion folks, the folks from our LGBTQ2 plus community, the Indigenous folks, we all need to get together because I think our silos still exist. I recently watched a video by Nikki Sanchez on decolonization, and she talked about this prophecy from her people, this Mayan prophecy of the, the time when the perspectives are coming together and we're starting to see through each other's eyes and that time being now. And I see that in all the work that we're doing and all of the work that the folks in this series have come together to do. And I think one, one of the things that we need to do is start being brave and start having those conversations on behalf of each other and break down the barriers that exist in inclusive education. Masai, let me see. Oh, 144, Snachalia um, in, in our culture. Well, we ha we say Maasai, and you'll see it in my emails and stuff if I send it to you. That's a derivative of French merci, but Snachalia, and I've said this before, is a bigger thank you. It's deeper. It's you honor me with your presence. It, it you know, again, time is so important to educators. So it's an honor for you to share time and space with us. Maasai, everyone, have a great evening, and thank you for having me. Thanks, Leona so powerful to have your voice in the space and to bring together our beginning session in a way that helps us think about a decolonizing practice and indigenizing practice as relationship with the land and that we can connect to the land and be in the land and look at being well as something we can do in anything in our teaching that moves us out of the school and into education in a way that respects our local um, ways of knowing and being and helps us to over time connect with and build relationships and come to understand local knowledges. Thank you. I raised my hands. My computer's on my knee. So let's see if it can stay. Oh, it's rocking. There we go. I raised my hands to you. Folks, we are coming to the end of our first session. How is that even possible? Our second session, We'll have Sarah Florence Davids with, with us, and we'll be looking at some of the things that Jen popped into the chat box when we were all in the larger room. I realized my answer went to just my small group, um, but we'll be looking at decolonization and indigenization and the relationships between them. So we'll also be looking at us in terms of welcoming indigenous knowledge into our classrooms, um, thinking about protocol and um, engaging particularly with literacy practices. Um, so exciting that we're going here, everybody. And Leona, thank you for talking to us about moving past fear and into action. Um, and uh, you talked about bravery and much of the literature around equity and diversity is that you can't make a safe space, everybody, but we can build brave spaces where we make spaces for all of our voices to be present and that we're all uncomfortable and that that's okay, but recognizing for some students, some spaces are more uncomfortable. And so we're working to address that versus just claiming that we got it or thinking that we can't do it. We can do it together over time. Thank you to Leona. Thank you to Shelly. Thank you to Denise. Thank you, SD61. Thank you to the Lando Virtual Learning Center at UBC. And you will get an email in about a week or even less with a link to the recordings, um, a little bit cleaned up with a little bit less of my chattiness in the middle. Thank you, everyone. Have an incredible evening. It's been such a pleasure to be together. And I know you're doing hard work, but it's so fun to have these really deep, important conversations. Go get out on the land and get renewed. Good night, everybody.